Just about to start um, web streaming the meeting, so for anyone joining us on the live stream, we welcome you to the meeting. We've just completed public question time. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, council members and members of the gallery, we've got a number of disclosures of interest this evening from council members. The first being from Councillor Jimmy Murphy on item 9.2. It's a disclosure of impartiality interest. The nature of the interest disclosed by Councillor Murphy is that he works with YMCA in his work occasionally on the Leadville Carnival Festival. As a consequence, there may be a perception that his impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Murphy has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly next week. Um, the second disclosure I've received is also from Councillor Murphy. It's a financial interest disclosure on item 5.7, propose alterations to hotel. The nature of Councillor Murphy's disclosure in this instance is that he ha uh, his business has a financial association with the Rosemount Hotel in that he occasionally books entertainment for the venue through that capacity. The next disclosure of interest I've received is from Mayor Emma Cole in relation to item 9.2, community budget submissions. The nature of the interest is that one of the community budget submitters, Mrs Anne Bank, provided volunteer campaign assistance. Sorry? Bait. Sorry. Mrs Anne Bait um, provided volunteer campaign assistance to the Mayor during her 2017 mayoral campaign as declared on the City of Vincent gift register. As a consequence, there may be a perception that the Mayor's impartiality on the matter could be affected. The Mayor has disclosed that she will consider the matter on its merits and will vote accordingly at the Council meeting next week. And the final disclosure of interest I've received is a proximity interest from Mayor Emma Cole in relation to item 6.1, the Capital Works update, and specifically the Anzac Road traffic calming project which has been impacted by Water Corporation Works and which was approved by Council in August last year. The nature of the Mayor's interest in this occasion is that um, she is an owner-occupier of her primary and only residence on Anzac Road in Mount Hawthorne. And I've received no other disclosures, Mayor Cole. Thank you, CEO. So we now move to um, questions in relation to the reports. But given that we've had so many questions tonight from the public gallery on item 9.2, community budget submissions, I will move that we go to that first. And perhaps before we go to council member questions, we might just work through some of the questions asked by the public gallery tonight. So first of all, um, and these will probably go to a variety of directors, so the director that wants to answer first, please shoot your hand up. Um, in relation to um, YMCA HQ, we've had a number of questions um, around um, counselling not being part of the submission and whether there should have been reference to that, about reference to part of their submission being core business and seeking more of an explanation around what is core business and what does that mean in relation to their submission. Um, we've had some questions about um, other re revenue generation being blocked by the City of Vincent, so could we please have a response to that, what potential revenue generation has, has um, been potentially blocked? And um, in terms of the detailed statistics being sought by the city, um, it, it seems that that work is underway but is going to be implemented over the next 12 months. So is there some wriggle room in, re in relation to that level of statistical reporting while those systems are implemented? And just... OK, so we'll go to the Director of Community Engagement first. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, first of all, I, I will acknowledge that the wording in the community budget submission does um, refer to the fact that counselling um, is uh, part of the submission. Counselling is certainly a part of the services that YMCA HQ provide more generally and it is included in their submission. However, the submission clearly is seeking funding towards their Why Create program and that was uh, the basis for the uh, review by the officers. Uh, in terms of, uh, so that it is acknowledged that the counselling isn't part of their, their community budget submission request. 
In terms of, of core business, the approach that administration has taken with all of the community budget submissions um, was looking at not providing funding towards core business, uh, and, and what we referred that to primarily was staffing and employee costs. What we looked to do in all instances was support um, programs and service delivery, but what we sought not to fund was um, management costs, staffing costs, staffing on costs and utilities and, and those sort of things. So that is the reference to uh, core business. Uh, thirdly, uh, in terms of revenue generation, I believe, and I, and I will look at this further, I believe that was in relation to a, a mobile food vendor um, that they were looking to provide. Um, shaking heads, that might be correct. So I will take that one notice and, and just get some clarity um, on that one. And, and finally, the, the request for the statistics Certainly, uh, administration is happy to show some flexibility there. I guess the purpose of trying to get some of those stats, whilst we certainly acknowledge and appreciate the work that the Y does, given their location in Leadable Town Centre, close to a, a train line, it is certainly a, a hot spot for young people from throughout Perth. Um, and we um, certainly acknowledge that and support the continuation of that. Uh, but what we're just seeking to understand is how many of the, the young people that attend the HQ are actually local residents as opposed to young people from outside the city of Vincent. Uh, that won't necessarily influence the level of support from the city moving forward, but we just thought it's an important thing to understand the difference between local young people and broader young people accessing the services. So in terms of the funding that we've recommended, we've re recommended $30,000, and that was on the basis of fully funding their program costs which equated to around about $20,000, and then a $10,000 contribution towards their other management, utilities, and staffing costs that they included in their budget submission. So that was the basis of the administration assessment. Thank you. Do any other council members have questions on in relation to this particular submission? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Just. Um just, I think just because it's important information to have, um, the comment was made about the city having previously supported um, HQ at $75,000 a year and offering $60,000 last year. Um, I do note that we, uh, I think three years ago, extended the lease term for a period of 20 years. Um, if we could just get some financial data around the, uh, the net letable value or the value of uh, the, the premises that is provided as well, because I think that the value of the support that we do provide, if it's going to be discussed in the chamber should be its full value, not just the financial contribution that we make uh, in grants. So I think it would be good to have that information included in the response. Are there any other further questions in relation to this item? Um, Director, do you intend to speak further with representatives from HQ during the week just to get a bit of dialogue happening and further clarification on some of those matters? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, most of the conversations have been through our um, community partnerships team. Um, given uh, this is coming formally to Council next week, I'll engage directly with the Y. Thank you. I'm also happy to talk to you during the week if you'd like to um, contact me here. So feel free to do so. Um, okay, the next item that was raised in relation to community budget submissions was um, in relation to 1.18, which is um, Ann Bates' submission on the, we call it the giveaway park, um, because of the giveaway sign artwork in the park. Um, Anne has asked questions about uh, having a footpath in place of eco-zoning, um, fence and gates, and um, the cost of the upgrade to Britannia Road. So if I could just also add to that, with eco-zoning, my understanding is that the gravel paths are part of the eco-zoning and um, that that sort of goes hand in glove, if you could perhaps clarify that. And in relation to the um, fence, I did also request whether it could be looked into um, as an interim measure, putting some um, mesh um, within the existing fence, which is an open um, style of fencing, just to give some protection from Scarborough Beach Road. And if you could also um, just remind us the cost of the Britannia Road um, upgrade. Uh, through yourself, Madam uh, Cole, uh, Mayor Cole. Um, yes, certainly the gravel pass can be inclusive of the echo zoning. Um, in respect to the fence, we've actually got a separate 
budget allocation included $5,000 to undertake the works that were suggested to infill the fence and put the panels in. And in respect to the last part, Britannia Road, and unfortunately I don't know the answer to that, but I can certainly take it on notice and find out for you. So just to clarify, the $7,500 can be used for eco-zoning and gravel footpaths, and that there's an additional $5,000 to look at retrofitting the fence to enclose the fence? That's correct, yeah. Okay. And um, we can also provide the amount that was spent on the Britannia Verge upgrade. Okay. Are there any further questions, Councillor Lowden? Uh, just a question through the Chair, through to the Director of Communities, uh, Community Development. Uh, how would uh, this, this um, uh, give way park fit into the proposed uh, open space strategy? Would that be part of that review? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the, the fundamental element in the first instance with the POS strategy is assessing uh, the hierarchy and, and determining where this particular park would um, lie within that hierarchy. That will then, then inform the levels of service. Um, having said that, something like eco-zoning is a fairly contemporary practice across um, all open spaces, so I wouldn't have thought that any of the works proposed through this community budget submission would um, impact the, the strategy outcomes. Councillor Lowden. So just to clarify that um, this site would be reviewed as part of the public open space strategy and so consideration of things such as park benches or whatever would be appropriate for this site would be considered out of that and then there would be a broader recommendation that would come through. Is that an accurate representation? Yes, that is correct. So the POS strategy will determine a hierarchy levels of service and then apply those uh, levels of service to each individual park. Uh, whilst it won't be providing a specific design for each park, it provides, I guess, a high end and a low end of infrastructure provision that would inform uh, then the budget process. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next item raised from the community budget submissions, and that was uh, Mr. Meyer raised the issue of the toxic e-waste uh, collection and whether we could consider a lower level collection with skip-ins and staff assistance rather than the full-blown collection arranged by Mindari Regional Council. Um, Director, do you have any comment to make on that? Uh, through the Chair, we'd have, obviously have to research it, but I'd have reservations about providing skip bins for toxic waste on a verge scenario without any controls over it, which is essentially what the e-waste days provide, a controlled environment and a you know, safe transport method. But we can certainly research the possibility of something lower scale. Thank you very much. Any further questions on toxic waste collection? Okay, we'll move on then to questions raised by representatives of the Early Birds Playgroup. So first of all, I can think I can answer the majority of your questions because um, I have met with Denise and then with Bernadette on two um, separate occasions and have had a follow-up meeting with staff on the 29th of June um, just to sort of go through what was, what was already on budget for early birds versus the community budget request. So the ceiling replacement $8,000 was already on last financial year's budget, 1617, but the works have been delayed. So I have requested that staff look into um, skylights and downlights as part of that upgrade, given that the ceiling's been replaced. It is only half of the ceiling, it's the back section, so it won't deal with the, the full section, so where you have the kitchen, etc. In relation to the $10,000, that my understanding was that that was for the replacement of the switchboard, and I have requested that advice be given on whether that can be loaded, located externally, because I know that was one of the concerns raised about having the switchboard inside the building and the safety aspect. Um, I then um, was informed that there would be an additional $10,000 to deal with your your budget submission separately. Um, I did look at uh, Highgate Playgroup's um, contribution was 13500 so that we're sort of looking at a, a figure around that. So I can understand that why there is some confusion around um, what it says in the community budget submission um, where it talks about $10,000 has been included to undertake 
further improvements to the building, um, such as the non-compliant switchboard, because my understanding was that that would be separate, so I will follow up on that. And then in relation to um, the, the funding in addition to the switchboard and the ceiling upgrade, and there's also $5,000 for building compliance work, um, the, this amount of money that we were looking at as a contribution towards your particular submission as opposed to that work which the city had already determined was necessary um, would go would need to go towards capital renewal rather than maintenance and we listed some of the issues that you had raised and I did ask a staff member to contact you and talk to you about what your preference would be so the process in terms of community budget submissions is is what we're sort of experiencing now in that we receive community budget submissions, that they are evaluated by staff, that they come back through the council meeting process through a briefing, you're informed that that happens, and then we have a council meeting where council members either take the advice and go with the recommendation or move amendments. So um, it's, it isn't the case necessarily that there is um, an ongoing discussion that between you know, information sought where it's needed and I have in this case requested to get some information back from you um, and I'm happy to follow that up before the council meeting and talk f further with you if need be. Um, but that's, that's the general process for community budget submissions. Um, in, in your case, um, has, there does need to be a bit of follow-up with you to talk to you about what your priorities are if we're looking at a smaller amount of spending as opposed to a complete redevelopment. So in relation to um, some of the funding that has um, been re requested for clarification, are there any comments from the directors in relation to the $10,000 that was already on draft budget for the switchboard versus an additional $10,000 recommended? That was my understanding, but that's not what um, 7.20 states. Uh, through the chair, there is ten thousand dollars on the budget for the switchboard to be uh, relocated externally. A new switchboard. Um, but my understanding was that there would then be an additional ten thousand dollars that would be um, that would then go to some of the capital renewal of the building that um, would go some way to deal with the, the issues that have been identified around um, skylights. Um, I think I had a list here. I'll just open my email again. Highlights, LED downlighting, potential replacement of air conditioning units to inverter units, um, replacement of turf in the western playground, um, highlight windows above the internal doorway and potentially looking at removing the sliding um, window fly screens in the internal wall to create an opening, subject to further discussion with early birds playgroup representatives. Uh, through the chair, that it was approximately twenty odd thousand dollars for that complete list, and that was on the basis that the state was going to contribute ten thousand dollars to that. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, can we just have clarification that the draft budget um, will contain ten thousand dollars from the city of Vincent for the switchboard, and additional ten thousand dollars towards <coughs> towards additional capital renewal? Through the chair, perhaps I can assist. On page 88 of the budget, there includes three items. So there's a carry forward funding of $8,000 for the, um, the, the replacement of the ceiling. We have the switchboard renewal for $10,000, so again, that's funded by the city. And we have a $20,000 um, item for general upgrades, and that's the $10,000 from the city and $10,000 grant. So um, that's where the state, but that's where the draft budget is at. I'm happy to talk to you during the week. If um, so, is that does that clarify the situation? I, I can't do question and answer. I'm just perhaps if you could. Okay, all right. Happy to discuss that with you further. But in in effect, that is a total funding of twenty eight thousand from the city, um, with the ten thousand dollar component from the state member for Perth. 
Um, the twenty thousand dollars is is made up of ten thousand dollars from the state member for Perth and ten thousand dollars from the city of Vincent. But I, I, I'm sorry, I can't do the backwards and forwards with you. But I'm more than happy to talk to you. Please do give me a call, and I'm happy to talk about it further. Any questions that you have? Okay. So they were the questions from. Oh no, we had we had. Um, sorry, sorry, questions Madam from Mayor, Befriend. I still have a question. Oh, sorry, in sorry. To that item. Yes, that... council members, do you wish to ask questions about early birds playgroup? Uh, it's not specifically early birds, but the building itself. Just if we can get some comment in the briefing notes about the compliance issues in the building that don't relate to the tenancy. So obviously, a non-compliance switchboard is an issue. But if there are issues, other issues in the building uh, that would have to be resolved as a compliance matter, so not through the community budget submission process, but as the owner of the building, just some clarity about what the actual that those issues are, um, and some of the, uh, um, I suppose, energy saving uh, matters that have come as proposals to us, but that would provide a benefit independent of the submission from early birds. That would be appreciated. Does anyone wish to comment, or would you like to take that on notice? No, through the chair, I can get a breakdown on what the compliance okay. issues are. Okay. So I know that there is five thousand dollars in addition, <laughs> which is about um, compliance upgrades. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions, Councillor Buckles? Thank you, Madam Chair. Could I just ask um, what is not in this particular report? I'm sure it is in something we've been given previously. What early birds uh, specifically asked for in terms of dollar amount, just to get an idea as to where we're meeting in that? Jeez. Director, can, have you been you've had the answer from a council member? No, he said 470,000. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head. I think it was something like 70,000 upwards. 78,000. 78, Thank you. Um, any further questions on the early bird submission? Okay, we'll move on to the befriend submission, which has been supported by administration. Are there any questions in relation to this item? No questions? Okay. Um, we'll then move on to any general questions on 9.2 community budget submissions. Councillors. No questions? Okay. Oh, Councillor Hallett, yes. Can I just clarify the timeline around when um, submitters of submissions um, have been notified and what that communication looks like over the next couple of weeks as well? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I can answer that. So all submitters late last week received an email from the city advising that the assessment process of the submissions has now been concluded through discussion with council members, that a report coming to this evening's council briefing has been finalised and that that same report will be then presented to the council meeting next week. Um, that uh, email communication to all submitters also advised that um, all members of the public are welcome to attend the council briefings and meetings and uh, speak for three minutes during the public question time and have been provided with a copy of the agenda report as well as the attached table. Sorry, and will, will there be any other communication directly with them after the meeting? <coughs> Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's the case. The administration recommendation is for Council to uh, receive the submissions, endorse the responses, and secondly, subject to adoption of the budget, to notify all persons and groups who made a submission of the outcome of their proposal. So everyone who went to the trouble of making a submission will receive a personalised notification that advises exactly uh, what the position was in respect of their, of their request. Any further questions on community budget submissions? Okay, we'll go back to the start of the agenda, moving through planning items, starting with 5.1, 395 Bulwer Street, West Perth. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Hallett? Yeah, could I just get some um, clarity for, um, I think they are still here, um, the query around the safety of roof specs that were um, recommended by the DAC? Um, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, on further review of the report, um, there are a number of changes to the conditions that, that need to be worked through with the applicant to make it clear exactly what the changes are. Um, and as part of that conversation, we need to um, establish exactly whether, exactly what the fire requirements um, will be with 
the alternative roof form. It's not intended that that roof form continue um, all the way along. Um, it's simply to address the facade issue that the DAC had. They had a significant issue with the presentation and design of the development in the context of that location and the, particularly the, the new development next door and the traditional development on the other side um, to the west. So uh, there were significant concerns. These conditions are fundamental to the city's recommendation for approval um, and over the next few days we'll work with the applicant to refine these conditions um, and if there are any changes we will provide that in the briefing notes um, and we'll also advise the applicant's position on um, the final recommendation as part of the briefing notes. Councillor Leiden. Uh, two questions. Um, just carrying on from that first question, um, that will also clarify the landscaping component, which was one of their things. Correct. Um, and then the second thing was, and this is to help me with my understanding, the, the previous application is currently with SAT and is potentially going to a full hearing. This is a new application, so yeah. Uh, no, through the Mayor, um, the SAT has invited the applicant to submit revised plans, which are the plans before you. They're still the same development application, um, but the Council are tonight considering the revised plans, not the previous proposal, but the revised plans. Um, and so the decision on this um, will, if Council uh, decides to substitute the decision, that will be the decision that becomes um, the subject of the SAT matter. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, just in relation to the fire compliance, if we can just get an indication of uh, the cost of, or not, I actually don't care about the cost, but the confirmation that a, an internal firewall is able to be built and therefore, as with many other buildings anywhere on earth, you'd be able to have a continuous roof uh, that goes above dwellings that require fire separation. That would be great. Um, can I ask whether the lowering of the roof to a 20 degree pitch was something that was proposed via mediation by the city or by the applicant or is that something that just appeared uh, in the revised plans? Uh, through the Mayor, I'll have to confirm that I wasn't present at the mediation um, but I'll speak to the officer that was and confirm that in the briefing notes. All right, and can I just confirm as well, so the massive increase to the, um, to the courtyards uh, on the ground floor is 20 centimetres deeper because they've gotten rid of an ensuite and therefore um, made a larger bathroom but there's a 20 centimetre increase so we've got 1.54 metre depth on one side and one point, from 1.23 uh, and I think it's about 1.5 on the other side, is that correct? Uh, through the Mayor, that's my understanding but again I will confirm that um, and provide that in the briefing notes. It's, um, it's wider as well as further so there were a number of changes to the dimension of that courtyard but they were of the order of um, tens of cents of, of centimetres. Oh, if we can get some of that data and the other thing that's missing and apologies for the visual um, but the what's missing so when you see the 2D representation from the frontage and you see the upper floor balcony and then there's the planter box in front you the plans don't in profile they do, but in the 2D uh, version of what's provided, you don't get the sense that that upper floor balcony and planter box actually sits, I don't know how many centimetres from the street, but it's not far at all. It actually compl almost completely encloses, it's shown as a dotted line over the alfresco, but we don't have that measurement available to us. If we can get confirmation of what that measurement is um, and the proposed species of trees that are going to grow in that gap between the protruding uh, upper floor, I won't call it a balcony, but planter box, uh, and, the, uh, and the actual edge of the fence, because from what I can see from the drawings, if you, look at the, uh, if you look at it in section, the trees have had to be drawn pretty skinny to be able to even fit in the drawing to show. Um, so so the, the, the idea of mature, I just want some clarity around the capability of mature trees to be able to grow in the space that's provided uh, in that front planter. Uh, section and also um, and I'll probably seek comment from you separate to uh, to this because it but it relates more so to principles at SAT but the the argument from the planning consultant relies extraordinarily on the development adjacent to it at 393 um, Bulwer Street so if we can just get some clarity from you it talks a lot about emerging and changing streetscape and R80 and what we should expect uh, in the area as a result of what's been developed next door 
given that was refused by the city initially and went through the SAT process and we've significantly changed our planning framework since then, to what degree should we be relying on that setting the, the precedent or that being the reliable uh, base from which we should look at the emerging streetscape rather than our planning policies and the original refusal of that application? So if we can just get some comment around that, that would be appreciated. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we'll provide the, the detailed um, setbacks and um, measurements in the briefing notes um, in relation to the applicant's reliance on the neighbouring development. Um, the way the design principles of the R codes are set up, um, there is certainly um, the existing developments um, on the street are relevant considerations and are fundamental to any design principle assessment. So uh, whether they were approved under a previous planning framework or, or otherwise, um, there's, the city cannot amend those design principles. They are fundamental to the assessment of development applications where they aren't deemed to comply, or even where they are in, in some circumstances. Um, what the city can do is make it clear what the design outcome um, is that we are trying to achieve on a particular street or in a particular area. Uh, the built form policy does go a long way to establish that and it is, it is certainly different to um, what was, in some ways it's very similar to what was set out under the RDEs previously, the city's previous policies. So we were pretty clear on the, on the types of development we were looking for previously and we still are in that the traditional design and those traditional elements of the streetscapes that have been um, part of Vincent for a very long time um, are what we are trying to um, bring into all new developments. Um, that is the major concern with this development that the DAC had and that, are, that is the reason for the conditions um, that we have proposed because those elements have not been brought into the development to a satisfactory level um, and certainly not to the level of the new development next door. Um, and so these conditions are and will need to be drafted to make it very clear that that's the outcome we're, um, we're requiring as part of this recommendation. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you, Mayor, to the Director of Development Services. Um, can I just ask why there was a minimum um, required of two bicycle bays when there's four dwellings? <laughs> Sorry, could you, could you repeat that again? There was a um, stipulation around having two bicycle bays um, in there, even though there's four dwellings. I'll have to take that on notice and check the calculation. <laughs> Um, and just also, is there any areas within Vincent that you can imagine um, that the administration would support a waiver of minimum parking requirements? In relation to this development, uh, just generally, uh, yes, there would be circumstances. In relation to this development, the, the key issue here in relation to the visitor parking is that the removal of the crossover increases the availability and adds a parking bay into the road reserve. So in that case, I think there is a legitimate argument. And in similar cases, I can see that, um, that where they're now accessing the development site from the right of way and creating additional parking bays on the road, that a reduction um, could be considered and warranted. Um, and Councillor Gontoshevsky. Uh, just further on parking through your mayor to the Director of Development Services. Um, just in terms of no permits being issued to the residents uh, or the properties in this development, I'm just wondering regarding uh, you know, trades and services to the building that may not, be, uh, I believe the report references visitor parking and um, that uh, a two hour time may be appropriate for residential visitors. But um, just wondering in relation to our policy, um, whether there is the capacity for special permits, whether it may be required to trades or services that require extended parking? Uh, through the Mayor, yes, um, the builder could apply for commercial parking permit or temporary parking permits um, during construction. Thank you. I just would like to ask a question. One of the recommendations from the DAC was that the height of the central brick pier align with the eaves, and I just noted that that wasn't conditioned. If um, the development moves to a single roof structure, 
what would happen with the central brick pier? Is that something that's going to be discussed further with the applicant? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the, um, the amended, or well, the, the additional attachment seven, which was omitted from the report, um, which was circulated earlier, um, shows that that brick pier would be dropped down um, with the realignment of the roof so that it, that it finishes at a lower level at the eave. Um, that hasn't been discussed with the applicant and that's what we'll need to do in the next few days and provide that information to Council. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky? Oh, just, sorry, one more. Just in relation to the DAC recommendations in terms of landscaping, um, so is it intended that they will be incorporated into um, the discussions and the condition? I believe there was something to do with depths of planter boxes. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. The DAC's concern was the width of the planter box on the front balconies um, of the two units at the front were creating uh, a significant amount of bulk to those buildings because they need to be reinforced and they were quite high uh, and they were simply too large in the, in the DAC's opinion um, and needed to be reduced. Um, maintenance for such a large planter box that was essentially the back half of it would be inaccessible um, wasn't the kind of outcome that the city's looking for um, and would create a number of maintenance concerns that the city would and compliance concerns that the city would have to deal with as part of that landscape uh, plan and the management and maintenance associated with that. So the DAC's uh, recommendation was for the planter box to be um, reduced in width so that maintenance would be easier. That would also reduce the, requ the, the structural requirements and the size and bulk of that planter box, um, which would result in uh, a, a more refined development that from the street would align better with the adjoining properties. Uh, but again, the devil's in the detail in relation to that, and that's something we need to work with the applicant on. Um, so in essence, the, the amount of landscaping on that um, balcony would need to be reduced. We also need to speak to the applicant about whether that can be replaced elsewhere and the, and the percentages can be retained as recommended in the subsequent condition in relation to landscaping, or uh, whether that condition and the wording in the report will need to change to establish exactly what the ultimate percentage of landscaping would be with the reduction in the planter box on those front balconies. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to item 5.2, which is the North Perth Town Square public open space. Councillor Loden. Uh, just two questions. Um, first one is does this, uh, I might have missed it in the proposal, does this include the undergrounding of power for that site? And then the second one was, um, is it possible to provide at a cost for the view street car park design concept, which was also discussed in the report? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the cost of the view street car park urban design process is, in, is included in the financial section at the end. Um, it's 30, we've estimated it would be $30,000 for the concept designs, $30,000 for one of those concept designs to um, be assessed from a traffic perspective to understand how it would impact on the View Street car park, Angove Street and that connection between the two, um, and no, $20,000 for um, some valuations of the different options. Um, in relation to the undergrounding of power, given the estimated cost of that was in the order of $250,000, um, we haven't recommended that that become part of the, the budget or part of the project, um, given the return on that investment would be um, significantly um, underperforming from, from what we would expect. So um, that is an issue that we will be discussing with uh, Western Power um, separately. Um, and uh, that's part of the, the latter parts of the project to understand whether there's an option for them to fund that um, and potentially be part of the project. Councillor Toppelberg? Um, is the funding proposed by the state conditional upon the membership of the working group? <coughs> Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the letter from the state government, um, from the local member for Perth, uh, did state that, um, or did discuss uh, the working group, um, 
I don't have the letter in front of me, so I don't, I don't have the exact wording, but I'll provide that in the briefing notes. Councillor Gondoshevsky. And just further to that, um, in relation to the terms of reference of the working group, um, uh, is there a reason that um, uh, rather than consensus decision making or consensus recommendations, was uh, a voting was chosen? Um, I guess it seems to be somewhat out of line with our other groups that make advice and recommendations to the city. And I think also in relation to um, the use of a working group in this instance, um, is, has this model been used previously in relation to city projects for um, development of open space or redevelopment of open space? And is it intended that this model will be utilised in future? Through you, Mayor Cole, I could probably answer the first component of that question, and that is that um, the terms of reference for this group were actually modelled on the um, Council's other advisory and working group terms of reference that do reference voting as opposed to consensus um, achievements for moving different recommendations or proposals forward. Notwithstanding that that's the recommendation, it's because this is a very unique project and proposal, it's entirely open to Council to uh, modify the terms of reference that have been drafted in this instance. Um, in relation to the second question about whether or not this approach has been used historically in the city, I know that in the past there had been reference groups formed for the review of open space reserve master plan, so the Britannia Reserve Master Plan uh, group springs to mind. We would have to go back through um, archives and speak to other staff to establish if this type of, um, I guess, forum had been used in project instances previously, though. Right, just, um, Beaufort Street Enhancement Working Group was specifically made up of, of elected members, uh, members from council and from staff, and it specifically provided advice on f there was funding allocation given and the, the expenditure. Um, that's how we ended up with a whole lot of bike racks that we had to then remove and place inside a. Uh, a cage in uh, Beatty Park. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg, for that reminder. Are there any further questions on this item? Okay, I would just like to ask a question in relation to Clause 5 and whether we should actually reference in the Council um, recommendation Clause 5 um, the View Street property at Lot 15 because that's not expressly referenced in the um, draft motion. Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, I agree that should be clarified in um, in that recommendation. It's certainly clarified throughout the report, but we'll pull it into that recommendation before next week. Thank you. And the other question I have is that I note that construction is not um, due to commence under the proposed time frame until 18-19. I just wanted some clarification on the use of the uh, $250,000 grant from the state government and whether there's a requirement to expend that in 17-18 and whether we'll be able to do that under the current time frame. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, I've met with the Department of Planning in relation to um, the expenditure of that money. The current um, budget that the state government has is for that money to be expended by December this year. Um, that certainly won't occur in relation to construction, um, given councillors only considering the location of the public open space tonight. Um, there, the department has confirmed that there certainly is the option of both... Um, there's a number of options in relation to granting the money to the city um, and allocating it to a particular stages and phases of the project um, and potentially pushing it out to... Um, well, not potentially, there is the option of pushing it out to a next financial year. Um, but that's something that the city will, following on from this decision, um, the city will need to sit down and negotiate with the Department of Planning to um, determine the exact details and timing of the funding. So my main concern is that that is secured, um, absolutely. So if you could just clarify that um, before we make the decision 
although the time frame is not part of the decision that we'll be making, so perhaps there's some wriggle room there. Um, the other question, oh, I might just flag an amendment that I do find the working title North Perth Town Centre Public Open Space very unwieldy, particularly when you add working group to it, and I would probably flag an amendment to change the working title to North Perth Town Square, although it is going to be a rectangle, so I might have to think about that a little bit more. So just flagging that amendment with you that change to working title. Thanks. Uh, any further questions? Okay, move to 5.3, North Perth Town Centre again, this time parking restrictions on Lake Street and Grosvenor Road. Any questions, Councillor Loden? Uh, just a request in attachment one, is it possible to include a key of what the different colours mean in there? Um, and a before and after or something like that, just so that we can be clearer on what, what is changing, because it does get a bit tangled around in the description of what is and what is not happening. Yes, certainly. Any further questions? Can I move on to 5.4, which is 49 Tasman Street, Mount Hawthorne. Questions on this item? Councillor Loden? Uh, just the questions from the floor um, from uh, I think his name was Andrew Maybe. Um, there was a, a few questions he raised uh, around um, prioritising investors over residents and whether or not we can consider that as part of a decision um, the, that there he suggested there was a number of non-compliances with the application um, an issue around the dividing fences and also an issue around the height um, so if you could provide some uh, comment back on those questions. Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the city has received a planning application um, and is required to assess that against the state government's um, Planning and Development Act and Planning and Development Regulations. Um, there, there are a set of um, considerations that council can give. Um, there are a number of things that council um, can't have regard to, and um, this report sets out all of the rec all of the standards and considerations that council must have consideration to. Um, the way the the state government's planning framework is set up in the R codes is that there's a set of deemed to comply standards and a set of design principles where those standards are not met. Um, this proposal meets. Um, the vast majority of the deemed to comply standards set out in the state government's R codes. There are a number of um, elements that need to be assessed against those design principles that are also set out in the state government's R codes um, and where that's occurred um, the, the city has, or administration has provided a comment and an explanation for the council. Um, in relation to the specific items mentioned, um, the height of the development is deemed to comply um, and being two storeys um, in this location um, is, is acceptable. Um, in relation to the, the boundary fence, that is a, a private matter between the, the developer and the adjoining properties. Um, the, propo the application proposes a number of um, boundary walls which would potentially replace existing boundary fences. But again, that needs to be discussed um, between the builder and, and the um, developer. And if there are any concerns at all, then the city is available to mediate that process. Um, at, as part of the building application, the city will um, be requiring a dilapidation report in relation to this development because of the boundary walls and the fact that the adjoining properties are extremely close um, to, to the development. Um, and we'll be working hard to make sure that um, the builder complies with all of the regulations and requirements that the state government has. Um, our role is to ensure that they follow that process and that we um, work together with, your, with yourselves and with you know, the neighbours and the builder to make sure that um, there aren't any impacts on adjoining properties. Um, I think I've covered most of the issues there. Um, but if there's anything else, um, I'm available to be contacted and we can uh, discuss the details of the process together. Councillor Toppelberg. Um, just a couple of questions. So in relation to the landscaping, um, the drawing that's provided WD06 of 6, so that's on 
page uh, 126 of the agenda um, includes the street tree and all the paved areas shown in green. Um, if you remove them, it's pretty sparse. And I note that they are looking at a total of, I think, is it they're about 12 per cent below what the landscaping requirement is. Can you just give us some commentary, please, through you, Madam Chair, to the Director of Development Services? So 38.87 per cent is proposed uh, to be landscape uh, the areas proposed to be landscaped. Um, can we get some commentary in relation to the current status of uh, our built form policy, the landscaping requirements, and um, whether the how, how this proposal uh, is is meeting or those requirements or otherwise? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the in relation to the policy that the city um, adopted in December last year, uh, that is still with the Department of Planning, the WAPC uh, or the, the, um, their statutory planning committee um, are likely to consider it in August. That is the, the most recent time frame provided to us by the department officers um, to consider whether to adopt those and support those um, landscaping provisions. Um, so currently they're seriously entertained by the city um, and to be given due regard, but they're not um, the applicable deemed to comply standards. This application is an amendment to a previous approval, um, and that's what I failed to mention last time um, in, in my last um, comment. The application was approved by Council in September 2015, and this is an amendment to that approval. Um, the application doesn't align with the landscaping requirements that Council adopted as part of the built form policy, um, but it does align with the previous approval granted in 2015. Um, the, one of the conditions that is recommended to be amended as part of this um, recommendation is the landscaping condition, um, which specifically requires the landscaping of the verge to be, um, to be detailed. Um, and the city expects that the landscaping proposal um, that would subsequently come forth as a result of that condition would include a uh, significant improvement to the landscaping in the verge considered compared to what was previously proposed. Um, just a follow-up question on that in relation to the recommendation um, six, clause 6.1.3. It talk to, talks about additional mature tree planting with canopy cover. Um, but doesn't state any percentage. Is that intentional? Is it just to say to, to include additional trees but not to actually provide a percentage of what we'd like the canopy to achieve? Through you, Mayor Cole. The City um, has assessed the ability for uh, mature tree planting to occur and considers there are some opportunities throughout the development site which weren't previously considered as part of the, um, the previous approval. Um, However, it's, it's impossible to establish that without the applicant providing that detail. The applicant hasn't provided that detail to the city and so we haven't been able to establish a percentage. Um, we simply want to maximise the amount of tree planting and whatever percentage that equates to will be what is provided. Thank you. Any further questions on Tasman Street? Okay. Move on to 5.5, .5, which is 4280 Lord Street, Perth, change of use from eating house to consulting rooms, medical. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, just wondering if you'd be able to comment on the requirement for the window visibility stuff around activating the street um, and how that um, links in with privacy issues in terms of people accessing medical services. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The city's spoken to the applicant um, about this, and the applicant is willing, um, and I think it's a fundamental part of the proposal um, and its location, um, which is on a, a transit corridor and um, a quite an important one that requires activation and surveillance of the street. Um, the applicants identified that they're comfortable with that surveillance being maintained between the property and that ground floor um, and the street. The, the yoga studio or the, the Pilates floor area where um, the training would occur isn't considered to be um, a private, uh, a fundamental private area for 
um, the consulting room, uh, as, a, as opposed to the two rooms, the two, or, sorry, the single consulting room. Um, no, there's two. The two consulting rooms, which are um, set back from the windows and are available for private consultation. Um, so the applicant was comfortable with that, and I think it's a fundamental part of the proposal. Any further questions? No? Okay, we'll move on to item 5.6, which is 142 Summer Street, Perth, change of use from warehouse to lodg lodging house, including alterations. Any questions on this item, Councillor Toppleberg? Um, can we maybe get some comment? I think it's only, well, I think it's by policy the CEO, but from the Director of Development Services, given the residential nature of uh, the remainder of the street, why the consultation was limited to the bare minimums of the policy and effectively the adjacent properties and those directly across the road. So page 155 has got the consultation map. It seems relatively sparse considering the nature of the proposal and that most of the residential neighbours who would likely uh, be impacted for outside of business hours haven't, have had no notification other than that which is publicly available through the city's advertising channels. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The application was um, advertised in accordance with the policy. Um, the significance of this application compared to any other for advertising is something that um, we're currently... Re and whether advertising should be broader and should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis based on the potential um, interest and impact that a development has um, is something we're reviewing as part of our consultation policy review, which is currently being undertaken um, and will be presented to Council shortly. But in, in the interim, um, the City is advertising the applications in accordance with Council's policy. Councillor Hallett. So can I just, and just confirm that it's um, posted letters to those residents and that's the only maybe adverts in the local paper as well? Yes, sir, Mayor Cole. There, there were adverts in the local paper. I'll just check the report to confirm that. Yeah, it was um, it was advertised on the city's website, included in the in the Voice newspaper. Um, was available and and again emailed to all of our um, local precinct groups as part of the weekly email. Um, so it was advertised broadly and open. And there was a sign on site as well, the CEO has just clarified. Can I just, oh, sorry, I was just going to raise some questions and concerns about the car parking um, and the fact that no cash in lieu has been recommended for this site. Um, the car parking shortfall is six and only eight are required. So there's a provision of two tandem bays, plus there does appear to be a shared space area that potentially could be used as a car bay. Um, which would be d difficult to manoeuvre into if the tandem bays are already occupied, and an additional street on-site bay. But even if you included that, you could, you know, potentially say there are four bays available. Um, but I also so I have some concern about the lack of a cash in lieu recommendation, given that the warehouse that will become a boarding, sorry, the lodging house will effectively take. Uh, 58 people. Um, so my question is really around why was Cash and Lou not recommended and secondly um, how many existing bays have been removed in replace with where the communal area will be, like the existing car parking area versus the proposed communal area, how many existing bays are there with the warehouse and um, why was a, parking, a, a more comprehensive parking management plan not considered as part of the approval? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. On review of this report as well, um, it's clear that the management plan that's proposed as part of this application is, requires further updating. The applicant has advised the city that the residents of the lodging house will not be driving vehicle or will not have private vehicles. Um, the nature of what Youth with a Mission does um, requires, well, it, it means that the people that stay there um, don't have their own private vehicles. They're here for short stints um, and they're not, you know, hiring a, a car 
and um, you know, using that car while they're on holidays. They're here to um, work with Youth with a Mission, um, who provide the services um, that, that, and you know, the transportation that those um, youth require. Um, so the management plan will need to be updated to make it clear that none of the residents will be able to have their own private vehicles. And I'll provide the details around the changes to the existing parking um, and a further explanation of that in the briefing notes. Through you, Chair. Um, to you, Director. It says that it will be used by youth with mission. Once we put this application through, what, how would we stop this particular organisation on selling rooms, on selling the business and basically opening it up for um, commercial um, lodging rather than just with youth with a mission? First question. And secondly, how's anyone going to police the compliance in regards to people staying there not having vehicles? It just, um, it just seems like a, uh, to be honest, a, a nonsensical, a nonsensical condition. So my question is, how will the city monitor that compliance to ensure that a whole lot of vehicles don't appear on the street? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, in relation to the first question. The, the management plan will be required, the condition needs to be revised, um, as do a number of the conditions in the recommendation, to make it clear that the management, that the, the parking, sorry, that vehicles are not permitted um, to be used by residents of the lodging house. Um, so that's the first thing. The conditions will need to be um, established to make it simple and easy for the city to undertake compliance action where um, residents are using their private vehicles. So that'll, that'll need to be updated. Um, the, the com from a compliance perspective, sorry, in relation to youth with a mission, that management plan and those conditions will apply no matter which owner uh, or operator uses the development um, or it's transferred to them, they'll still be required to comply with all of those, all of those conditions. Um, in relation to compliance, it's um, the same approach we take in other instances where if there are complaints received in relation to parking on the street, um, the, CIMP, the city will need to, um, the city's compliance officers will need to um, gather evidence that there are people in the lodging house using private vehicles um, and from there we would need to take compliance action against the, the owner or operator of the business. So. Um I think you're going to be too busy monitoring um, the church on Oxford Street to be able to do that, to be, to be frank. But I want to know how you're going to monitor that compliance because this is the second application that's come before council where um, a parking plan is going to be in place. We're going to be responsible for doing all the monitoring and we're going to be able to hit the owners up. So I, I, by next week, I would like to see some more detail about how in a democracy, you are going to be able to stop somebody who's at that place paying their way in a lodging house, either through youth with a mission or if they further on sell those rooms or on sell this business, because I'm assuming once we approve this, that's what it is, it's going to be able to be a lodging house. How is the city going to stop an individual staying there from actually having a car? And what are you going to do about it if one of your officers notice a person parking their car and walking to the youth with a mission um, lodging house. I, I just don't. I don't buy it. I'm, I'm afraid, director, and this, this that concerns me um, in particular because it's a very busy street, and I don't believe there's been appropriate consultation. So, are you able to by next week provide a more detailed plan for how it's going to be monitored? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. I'll provide that in the briefing notes. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Um, just two things. One, I think this is an application that we should seriously consider um, tying to the applicant, um, because otherwise it could well become, uh, uh, with very little change, um, quite easily become a youth hostel or, uh, or similar. Um, and whilst the management plan may need to apply, um, I think Councillor Harley made a salient point in relation to that, so I think we should consider. I also think, given what we are proposing, what's happening in and around the area, that it would actually be appropriate to look at uh, uh, a sunset clause on that uh, approval of a reasonable period. I'm thinking 10 years or something of that nature, but I, 
uh, obviously there'd be an impediment to it existing if it was to be short, but I just uh, I would hate for the uh, further development of that area to be compromised 10, 20, 30 years down the track because of the existence uh, of a lodging house that perhaps doesn't fit with the future vision for the area. So uh, if at that time, yes, I, I'd, I'd be... I'd appreciate if we could um, prepare an amendment that would look at that, and I think for yeah, 10 years would probably be an appropriate time, and like all other time-limited uh, applications or otherwise, if it's operating as it should and it's a, a welcome member of the local community, then uh, we should, uh, it shouldn't have any issue in being further approved. Any further questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky? Uh, yes, so just um, forgive me if I've missed it. Um, just wondering through you to the Director of Development Services, what, if any, bike parking requirements there would be? I presume if they don't have cars, they may want bikes. Would be good. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll review that and provide that in the briefing notes as well. Thank you. Any further questions? A few issues to work through on that one before next Tuesday, Director. Um, moving on to item 5.7, Councillor Murphy is strolling out of the room for a little while. This is um, 459 Fitzgerald Street, alterations to an existing hotel, which is the Rosemount. Are there any questions in relation to this? Councillor Toppleberg. Um, I'm happy for it to be taken on notice, but just in relation, so the, the properties on our uh, heritage inventory category B uh, my understanding, having looked at historical photos and looking at what's been removed from the building, is that uh, a large part of its heritage value architecturally has been altered significantly. And on this side of the street, this is, I think, the second or third, so where the... Uh, um, I've gone blank. What are they called? The big metal things you put beer in? Kegs, that's it, where the keg drop was, uh, has been uh, altered. And we're now looking up. I guess if we could just get some commentary, perhaps, from Heritage as to what exactly what the uh, what the what the purpose of the uh, if we're going to allow alterations to the building and to the exterior in particular whilst they are in keeping with what's there just some commentary around the, the heritage uh, value of the building in its current form and uh, uh, whether because I understand also that the owners ha have looked at um, significant development in and around and elsewhere on the site I also understand um, they've, uh, they've had heritage restorations of similar properties elsewhere where they've actually reinstated some of those um, external features that perhaps were more in keeping with the original intent of the heritage listing. So if we could get some commentary around that in the briefing notes, that would be appreciated. Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the City has undertaken a... Her heritage Office has undertaken a full assessment, so I can provide that assessment in the briefing notes. Any further questions? Councillor Lowden? Just a query about uh, egress and ingress and if there's any issues with uh, fire exits because we're closing up two um, doors basically in, into a fairly large area and that room does cater to quite a large number of people as well. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll take that on notice and um, provide you with that information as well. Anything further on the Rosemount's alterations? OK, we'll move on to 5.8, 11 Woodville Street, North Perth. Change of use from single house and home occupation to single house and one non-medical consulting room. Um, and just before I take questions, Director, I do think the title of the item just needs to um, change a little to include the words to single house and one non-medical, etc. Otherwise, I think it's changing from a single house and a hairdresser to just being a single consultation room on its own. Correct. Yes, Thank that you. will be updated before next <laughs> Thank week Thank you. As well. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Lowden. Just uh, two questions. Um, so on that same topic, just to confirm, so it's a hairdresser plus a single house with a hairdresser becoming a single house with a hairdresser and a medical a non-medical consulting room. So they're both in the same building, they're not going into this proposed sub as subdivided property at the rear. Okay. And then the second one was, um, is it possible to provide the utilisation or the uh, street utilisation data from the North Perth uh, car parking survey that we did recently for this street? Because we talk about that the street's parked out, um, but it would be good to see that information because we have something fairly recent. 
yes, I'll provide that in the briefing notes too. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you, Mayor, to the um, Director of Development Services. Can I just confirm, with the, the existing hairdresser um, and adding the new use, um, it's the addition of an additional use that will create greater parking issues. Um, why isn't the existing hairdresser client use also causing parking issues? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, my understanding is that the site provides adequate parking for the hairdresser, so it's deemed to comply, um, so the parking standards in our policy are, are achieved. Um, but by adding this consulting room, there's not enough space for the adequate for adequate parking to be provided. Councillor Buckles. Thank you for your question through to Director of Development Services. Look, there's a, there's a section, I meant to write the page number, but I didn't write it down, and it said that this, the new use will have one client and no staff. Is that correct, or is there a staff member? <laughs> through you, Mayor Cole. On... on <laughs> On review of this report as well... There'll be a mobile phone with an app playing as you walk into the room. <laughs> on review of this report as well, there needs to be some refinement of the, of the comment section in particular and some of the conditions too, which will be undertaken before um, next week. Um, no, there is one staff member and there will be up to one customer at any one time for the consulting room. That's the proposal. That, that, that's fine. I just, I just, I actually thought maybe the hairdresser was also the other therapist, and they may change change rooms, which I thought was reasonable. But um, there's, a, there's a, there seems to be emphasis put on, you know, whether it's a, whether it is a medical consulting room or not a medical consulting room. And again, the wording of the report seems to suggest that it may comply if it was a medical consulting room, but doesn't comply because it's not a consulting room. But I would have thought the load on you know, the actual use would be the same. Great, great, great. Um, if, sorry, if yeah. I can just clarify. that The only reason there's an emphasis on medical consulting room versus non-medical consulting room is because our scheme has a definition of medical consulting room. We have a policy that sets out definitions of all different types of consulting rooms, most of which aren't in the scheme, and so that's the basis for it being a use not listed and being before you tonight. Otherwise, it would be determined under delegation. So it's the only reason it's mentioned. Um, it will make no difference to the parking requirements and the suitability of the use, whether it's medical or non-medical. Uh, so, Shimna, if this had been a medical consulting room and was a listed use, I assume that this would be refused under delegation. Yeah, okay. Th that's correct. Councillor Hallett. Um, and just a repeat of previous ones, did the applicant speak to the city before applying? Yes, the applicant did speak to the city before applying um, and the city officer advised the applicant um, that who was interested in pursuing this um, that they couldn't give them an absolute answer, yes or no, that if they wanted that they would need to apply and so the applicant um, applied to um, find out whether it would or wouldn't be appropriate. Can I just ask a question around home occupation versus a um, unlisted use for a non-medical consulting room? Um, in terms of home occupation, um, other than a home office or a hairdresser, what other potential uses could you have for home occupation? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, there's a number of uses. It essentially um, could be uh, yeah. a number of different types of home business, beauty therapists, etc. Um, the key is whether the operator of that business resides at the premises. So um, in the case of the hairdresser, the operator does, but the, um, the consulting room, the operator doesn't. So, yes, I saw that on the rough map um, plan provided, it did talk about the room being leased, so not the home occupier. So if the home occupier... Um, basically came to the city and said I'd like to expand my business to two rooms um, I guess then it would have to be a second person living at that home that would then have to provide the services but then would it still 
it would still require an assessment against parking requirement, intense, intensification of the site in a residential zoning, is that those sorts of issues would still come into play? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, they would. Um, the floor space that's being used would come in um, to consideration the number of staff and the number of um, customers, etc. And just out of interest, when I was looking at the um, street map provided with the zonings, I just wanted to clarify that the aged care facility across the road, is that operating on an R40 residential zoning? Yes, through you, McCall, it's, that's certainly what the map says, but I can check that and clarify. Any further questions? Okay, move on to 5.5. Oh no, we've finished planning, we're on to technical services. Yeah, sure. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, Council Members, I've received a disclosure of proximity interest on this particular item from Deputy Mayor Councillor Ros Harley, specifically in relation to the bicycle network plan, uh, or bicycle network from Oxford Street North between Anzac Road to Scarborough Beach Road, which is one of the bodies of work that has been impacted by the Water Corporation projects. Councillor Harley has disclosed an interest on this matter on the basis that um, she lives in the vicinity of the subject works um, in the section of Oxford Street between Anzac Street and Scarborough Beach Road. I do just have a question to the CEO on that because both Councillor Harley and I have um, have made a proximity interest declaration. Um, I don't intend to ask any questions about the item that I've declared an interest in and given that a decision is not being made tonight, I'd just like to seek the CEO's view on whether um, we can remain in the room and ask questions on other items under that report. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I think that's a good question. I'm happy to provide some advice to yourself and Councillor Harley and also Council members generally. I think the first comment I would make is just drawing a distinction between um, Councillor Murphy's disclosure of financial interest from earlier in which Councillor Murphy left the chambers. I think that was an entirely appropriate thing to do for the simple fact that there is a, a, clear disclose, or a clear financial interest in relation to that particular item with Councillor Murphy as he had disclosed and that the decision that Council will be making on that matter next week is a decision afresh. In the case of the disclosures that have been raised by both Mayor Cole and Deputy Mayor <coughs> Councillor Harley, they are both items for which funding has already been included on or was already included on the 2016-17 budget by Council. In the case of the Anzac Road traffic calming project, Council had adopted plans for that project at its August 2016 meeting and were it not for the Water Corporation's um, pipe renewal works that have been impacting Oxford Street as well as Anzac Road, then both of those projects would have been completed in the previous financial year with the funds that had been allocated. And as the Mayor has indicated, the decision that will be before Council next week is, or the recommendation is to receive the um, update report on the Capital Works Program, note the reasons for the various programs and projects not proceeding, and to support carrying forward the funds that were already allocated for those initiatives. So it is not for Council to approve those works afresh. Notwithstanding, um, given that this is only a council briefing, it's not a decision-making forum. My advice would be for the sake of formality and to avoid any doubt or dispute at a later date, when council considers these types of disclosures of interest at its meeting next week, um, both the mayor and deputy mayor may request council's approval to remain in the chamber, participate in the debate and vote on the matter um, subject to compliance with um, or passing relevant tests that council needs to separately determine under the Act. Um, that has been done on various occasions by this council in the past and I think it would be appropriate for completeness to just do that next week. For the meantime though, for this particular discussion um, and unless any other council members have a concern with it, the disclosures have been made. I think they both err on the side of caution given that the recommendation and the report do not specifically provide for a decision to be made around those particular projects. 
And given that it's not a decision-making forum this evening, um, I personally don't have any objection with either the Mayor or Deputy Mayor remaining uh, in the chamber, although I note and agree with the Mayor's sentiment that she has no intention of making any comment or asking any question on the Anzac Road item. And I presume if that uh, same line were to be followed, then Councillor Harley might not have any question or comment to make on the Bicycle Network Oxford Street North project. Does anyone have any issues to, to raise around that? Okay. Councillor Tobelberg? Around that or around the report? Around okay. the advice from the CEO? No. Okay. All right. So um, in relation to 6.1, do we have any questions? Councillor Toppleberg? Just a capacity issue. Again, are we comfortable and confident that the carry forward uh, of these items, um, in addition to what's proposed in the new budget, will be not having the same conversation again in 11 or 12 months? Uh, Mayor Cole, um, in respect to the main roads jobs, that's predominantly their workforce. So we're just acting as the agents to, you know, to pay for essentially their improvements. In respect to the water court works, it really depends on if they all come together as a bit of a perfect storm towards the end of financial year, the completion of them, and yes, potentially there could be. But they've given us assurances they will try and stage the completion of their projects to allow us to, to do ours in an orderly schedule. Councillor Loden. Um, I know that it's 1.56 million in carry forwards. Um, I was wondering if we could get details of what that is as a percentage of the total capital works budget and also what that was for last, last year, uh, for the 2015-16 uh, financial year, so ha how much did we carry forward into 2015-16 into this, into 2016-17, and what was that as a percentage of the total capital works budget? Uh, Mayor Cole, I'd, I'd have to take that on notice. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I have a question in relation to Nova Lane reconstruction, $100,000. I was just wondering if we could, in the report or in the, um, in the briefing notes, have a time frame, approximate time frame on when that work will be completed. I do get regular emails from a couple of Nova Lane residents who um, are very insistent about the work happening as soon as possible and feeling very frustrated. So if we could please... Um, have a time frame and, and an ongoing communication with residents around when that work would happen? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we're in the process of sending out an information bulletin to advise the residents of, of the delay. Um, we'd be reluctant to be doing it at this time of year, just given the seasonal nature of taking the surface off a road, but we will definitely Im include that in the report for next week. Any further questions on the Capital Works update? Okay, move on to item 6.2, William Street, Perth, proposed parking restrictions. Any questions? Councillor Gontrzewski? Sorry, oh. I just, I'm a late um, proximity interest in this one. Okay, so should we just hold door. fire while Councillor Toppleberg completes his blue form? Through you, Mayor Cole, Council Members, Council Toppleberg has disclosed a proximity interest in relation to item 6.2, the nature of the interest being that Council Toppleberg's family owns a property on William Street within the proposed area for parking restrictions. Questions in relation, uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky. All right, this is just in relation to the reference around the possibility of potentially starting restrictions at 12 o'clock on Sundays. Um, so just wondering if I could get some clarification um, on whether there are other locations where we may employ a similar practice to be, I guess, considerate of religious practices of any denomination or potentially, you know, large groups of people that may be impacted by uh, paid parking. To the relevant director. I'm sorry, I'm not sure which one. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Col uh, Mayor Cole, sorry. Um, I'm not aware of any other locations in the City of Vincent that has a restriction 
or non-restriction till 12 noon on a Sunday. They're either all inclusive or no, not restricted at all. Can I just ask a follow-up question on that? Because I think the issue here is potentially having some kind of... Um, you know, it talks about the City of Perth starting at 12 noon on a Sunday. So I guess the question is how does um, our, the proposed parking restrictions, given that they are face-to-face -face with the City of Perth boundary, um, how, how do they um, compare and, and contrast? And should we potentially be looking at having similar parking restrictions given... given given that they're neighbouring um, City of Perth in that area? Uh, for you, Mayor Cole. I was trying to maintain the continuity with our existing parking restrictions that we have on the surrounding streets, and they've been there since 2011, and they all are seven days a week from 8am. So we we're going to almost create another anomaly by allowing a non-restricted period on Sunday mornings to 12 noon. Very fair point. Are there any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to item 6.3, the tender for general cleaning services at Beatty Park Leisure Centre. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Loden. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so re recognising that um, the information, some of the information provided is confidential, um, I'm going to have to make sure I don't get myself tied in words here. but. Um, there's a price differential between um, the preferred option, which is the more expensive option, and um, the second, third and fourth uh, proposals. Um, looking specifically, at, for example, at the financial st 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 stability question there, if that one assessment criteria was excluded and we just assumed that all of these organisations were financially stable, then the, third, the, the second and the third preferred options would actually be the selected option. So is administration comfortable that the highest cost option in this case is the best way forward when we compare them to option the second and third option? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Cole, um, I'm not sure I fully appreciate the, the point because uh, the way I read that is that, well, having said that, I do. <laughs> My apologies. I'm looking at it backwards. I'll, I can uh, do some further research on that and include that in the briefing notes. Mr Evans, do you wish to comment? Certainly. As, as a member of the panel, um, that was a question we asked ourselves after the initial evaluation, and that was uh, one of the core reasons why we went back and um, re-examined the top three tenderers, which is detailed in the report, specifically so that we could um, ensure that we were comfortable with those scores. and. Um, there was a small amount of adjustment to the financial scores to um, normalise them, and they still, in the end, we were very comfortable with the scores that we were provided. Thank you. Councillor Loden. Just to follow up on that one and maybe to clarify a bit, um, d it depends on how we structure our contracts, but if um, we structure them in a way such that um, if the entity goes out of business, we don't have an ongoing liability, um, and we just basically have to find a new person to clean the Beatty Park Leisure Centre, why should we include the financial sustainability, the stability of the organisation as an assessment criteria, given that in this case it makes quite a significant difference to the outcome? Um, who would like to respond to that one? Would that be a question for you, Director of Corporate Services? Uh, through the Chair, I guess I can make some um, general comments. The first is in terms of financial stability, particularly if it's a labour-based contract, um, it is very important to make sure that they do have the, the capacity to continue to pay their, their workers um, uh, rather than 
the potential that the city as the procurer could actually end up at some point being liable or in, endeavour to attach us for some degree of liability. So you always want to um, appoint a contractor that is financially stable. There's a, there's a disruption cost um, if they um, do happen to fold or are prevented from continuing to provide the service. So that's item one. Um, the other item is in respect to notwithstanding whether it was the right um, criteria to include in the tender or not, once it is in the tender, that is the only criteria that you can use um, in evaluating. So you certainly have to evaluate in accordance with the criteria that you have included in the tender. Thank you. I've, I've got a couple of questions and one of them following on from Councillor Loden. So what tools do you, does the city use to measure financial stability of the, of the businesses? Um, through the Chair, um, the three of the tools that we were uh, using in this instance were um, the, the, the level of their balance sheet, um, their, their profit and loss for at least the last two years, and um, evidence of um, uh, a trading history uh, of some tenure. Thank you. And my other question relates to capacity to deliver and what are the components that you're looking at in regards to capacity to deliver? Uh, to the chair, so on page 199, it outlines what we looked for in the capacity to deliver, and that included um, evidence of the finish that could be provided in terms of cleaning, evidence of site supervision, safe working practices, and environmental protection practices. So that included um, some of their corporate documentation, as well as um, in the evidence of finish photographs and such like of uh, current contracts that they currently operate. Um, and just on a final note, and this, um, the, our reconciliation action plan may not have been completed in time for this, um, so I think I probably know the answer to this, but to flag it, was there any consideration given to or do we have the capacity to do direct purchase through the Aboriginal Business Directory? And if there wasn't time to do it this year, is that going to be a consideration for next year um, to try and align with our Reconciliation Action Plan? Uh, through the Chair, um, I, I cannot comment in terms of this particular um, purchase or, or tender, but we are certainly considering that in the review of the, ten, of the purchasing policy as we speak, because that is one of the provisions under the recently changed um, regulations that permit local governments to procure directly. And we are endeavouring to um, incorporate that into our purchasing policy to determine how we might um, in include that within our exemptions. Any further questions, Councillor Harley? And none from me. Okay. Um, I would like to ask a question perhaps of the Director of Community Engagement. I note that the recommended um, successful tender is um, the incumbent cleaning contractor at Beatty Park. And I just wanted to ask two questions. Whether any complaints have been received about the cleanliness of Beatty Park Leisure Centre whilst this um, existing company has been the incumbent cleaner and also if there have been any complaints what has the responsiveness and um, I guess st standard um, has the standard been raised in response to any received complaints? 
uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I will uh, take that in, uh, those questions on notice and provide a response in the briefing notes. I, I can advise, generally speaking, uh, the quality of service provided by this contractor has been um, good. Uh, most of our concerns and challenges are during operating hours. Um, not blaming our own staff, but we have uh, staff cleaners during the day um, to make sure that the facility is in good condition when it's utilised. They are some of the challenges and some of the customer complaints we've had more recently. Sorry, I do have a final question um, I forgot to ask, and that is that uh, with this particular um, successful tender, did they offer any gifts, benefits or hospitality to any of the city's officers in the last... Um, in the last period of their contract. Uh, question on notice. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, that's easy to check just by looking at the city's gift register, so we can include that in the briefing notes. Any further questions on the cleaning tender? Council Loden. I just wanted to foreshadow an amendment and um, I'll send it through via email. Thank you, Councillor Loden. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to uh, corporate services items. 7.1, authorisation of expenditure for the 1st to the 30th of June. Any questions? Councillor yes. Toppleberg? Yes, Councillor. I'm sorry, through you, um, Mayor. I've got a question in regards to um, expenditure of $16,770 for temporary staff, for flexi staff. Um, are you able to, uh, through the appropriate director, give a an outline of what type of staff services were purchased for that in that period? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I will have to look into the details of that because it could have been derived from a number of different sources and we can supply that in the briefing notes. Thank you. And I've got a question in regards to credit card expenditure. Um, of the Chief Executive Officer and it's in regards to uh, gift cards in recognition of employees. There's two amounts totalling $6,953 um, in the month of May. So I've got a couple of questions in regards to the amount of expenditure in regards to gift cards. I note this particular policy 5.5.1 I think is um, up for renew in November this year because it's five years old at that point. So my question is in, are you able to give a breakdown without necessarily specifying names? Not really fussed about that. How many gift cards were purchased and what amounts? Um, and my other question is in looking, in reviewing this policy, I'm assuming that starts relatively soon. Will that policy come to council for decision making? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Look, apologies for not previously or already having provided a summary of that expenditure to council members. Um, I can assure you none of it was for myself. Um, and all of it was strictly in accordance with that council policy. The reason for the expenditure having been incurred in one lump sum is that um, we had a working group of staff that was actively reviewing and engaging with staff more broadly on completely overhauling the quite outdated um, reward and recognition policy that exists, that is the, um, the root of this particular expenditure. The expenditure in this particular instance represents, I think, 12 to 18 months worth of um, backed up um, rewards and recognition vouchers that have been um, allocated to staff in accordance with that policy. I can supply through the briefing notes the details of the number and duration, etc., to council members without any hesitation. Uh, I'm pleased to say that this morning um, the HR team provided me with a draft of the um, staff delivered or staff developed um, revised reward and recognition policy that is not grounded in providing um, voucher-based rewards. Um, my, all of my experience tells me that staff appreciate rewards that are more authentic than just vouchers and being rewarded for a job well done by appraisal uh, recognition or, or um, professional development opportunities. So the revised policy does deliver on those fronts. Um, I'll be happy to 
uh, provide a summary of the revised policy to council members, although it won't be coming to council formally for endorsement because it's a HR policy and employee related. Um, council will, though, be able to um, have input into um, all of those types of employee related matters at budget time each year when council determines the budget allocations. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. So, um, the uh, backhaul wireless link in Leaderville, is that part of the CCTV network works or is that part of our Leaderville wireless works? There's two amounts listed in the, in the current payment. Uh, through the chair, I can confirm that yes, it is part of the C uh, Leaderville CCTV system, uh, but an extension of that system to actually bring the control system back to this office. Okay, uh, a couple of others. Um, the uh, payment to CS Legal for Debt Recovery Services is that payment to chase money or is that commission on monies that are actually paid back to us? Is that the arrangement for the debt collection? If we can just get some clarity as to whether we pay on collection or we pay them to just chase. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we'll find that out in that particular expenditure. Um, also, clarity over the services provided uh, for the professional fees for Allerding and Associates, um, whether they were for representation or to provide planning advice. There's a significant sum there, it's $12,684. Um, can we get a breakdown this month of what the legal fees that we pay? Because it, it's quite extensive and predominantly shared between two companies. Um, I understand a lot of that relates to the batching plants, I would assume, but we can get a breakdown of what the month's legal services were, were for. And to the Director of Community Engagement, um, and I know I should know the answer, but can you tell me what the kids' sport vouchers are and how they're administered, please? Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole. The Kids Sport Vouchers uh, is part of the Department of Sport and Recreation program that's administered through local government. Um, it is administered based on your residential address, which is why when you look at the expenditure, you will occasionally see um, sporting clubs um, outside of Vincent. Uh, so the city of Vincent, like all local governments, is the, the agent. So uh, the individuals or the sporting clubs need to apply to us to seek the fees um, or seek the, the voucher, I should say. It's all fully funded by the Department of Sport and Recreation. Um, but I did note myself uh, last month there were a couple of clubs based in the city of Stirling. Um, that will be uh, residents from Vincent who play for sporting clubs in Stirling. And just the, thank you for that. Um, the last, well, I suppose it's, um, I will actually ask what the, the payment to Landgate, I assume that's it, the payment for the GRV valuation, the 175000 okay. Um, and just in relation to the purchasing policy, and I'm, it, it's not a, this isn't a, a witch hunting exercise, it never is, but just um, I think that they're seeing the data in this format when you do take the time to go through it, um, perhaps does highlight the opportunities for some areas to, uh, to look at local sourcing of products. There are, I know we've had discussions on many occasions about things like quality of fruit and veg for, um, for resale within the city and other things of that nature where there are quality issues but where there are simple things such as purchases of, a, of camera equipment or otherwise, um, I think there are opportunities to look at the purchasing policy that we should be preferencing local suppliers where possible um, for that. So I know that's not a question but just commenting that it, 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 does, it is highlighted when you go through line by line. Any further questions? Councillor Gondoszewski? Just one tiny one. Just to get a clarification on the difference between DAC meeting fees and DAC architectural services, if I may. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, they are the same thing. Um, there is, it's, it's just the way they're recorded. And they should be recorded as DAC meeting fees, but unfortunately they're recorded um, inconsistently. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the item 7.2 investment report for 30th of June. Any questions on this one? Councillor Loden? No? Okay. All right, we'll move on. 7.3. 7.3, dog um, amendment, um, dogs amendment lo local law. I'll get it out eventually. Councillor Murphy? 
Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> uh, just in regards to clause 5.1.1a, um, what would the ramifications for the city be if we were to remove this clause, <clears throat> which currently bars animals from entering local businesses? And would this be achievable within the current State Government Dog Act? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, this particular clause was reviewed, reviewed at length by both Rangers and, and Health Services. Um, Rangers did identify some concerns with uh, the control and behaviour of dogs um, in enclosed busy premises, uh, and on that basis we uh, didn't proceed with, with any amendment. Um, however, Health Services have confirmed that there's, there's actually no specific concerns with dogs being on commercial premises from a um, a, a health legislation or a specific uh, disease-based perspective, um, the exception being obviously uh, food businesses. Uh, so when we look at Clause 5.1a, there, there would be the ability to um, amend that if it was uh, Council's desire. Um, I, I certainly would recommend that uh, the prohibition within public buildings uh, be maintained. Um, Clause 5.13b uh, within the local law does indeed still permit uh, companion dogs to be present in, in outdoor eating areas. So fundamentally the only change would be uh, that within standard businesses, um, hairdressers, accountancy firms, they would be able to have dogs on their premises, uh, the exception being food businesses, which are uh, are under the Food Act and under the Food Standards Code um, a slightly different scenario. So it was considered administration didn't amend Clause 511A, but um, if Council desires we, we can look at that amendment. So that would mean no doggies in the cafes? Unless they have a, an outdoor eating area. Okay. Um, but what is, sorry, what's the current um, situation with uh, Alfresco? Is it just um, for guide dogs or can any dog be in an alfresco area currently? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, uh, companion dogs. Any dogs can be in an alfresco outdoor dining area. Sorry, just a slightly um, minor question. So what about where dogs have to be carried through a non-alfresco area to get into an alfresco area? I just know that was a particular issue for one business and they stopped allowing dogs in altogether. Um, the Director of Development Services may be able to assist. I know my understanding, speaking to both Rangers and Health Services, it's a, it's a, it's a practicality um, scenario. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the, the code actually says that um, a food business may permit a dog to be present in an outdoor eating or dining area. Um, obviously, if you need to um, get to that, at that outdoor dining area. It comes down to the practicalities of, of being able to do that. Um, I don't think it would be in the spirit of the legislation or our local law to prevent someone walking their dog um, from one location to get to the outdoor dining area. But I can certainly take that on notice and put some additional advice in the briefing notes. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Oh, unless Councillor Murphy's going to do it, I'll foreshadow an amendment in relation to allowing dogs into private. I'm happy to email through to work with administration in relation to the wording around public buildings and so on. Can I just ask a question that it would remain at the business's discretion? Um, the only thing I'm considering is whether a dog owner saw this as a right to enter any business, um, given that that clause would be removed, but how would we maintain that it is the right of the business owner to allow access to dogs or not? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I can confirm that the Dog Act actually states that a dog, that a dog can be any, in any place that is not a public place where consent has been given by the occupier or owner of that property. So that is still required under the um, Dog Act. Uh, so that is still a requirement. Um, it wouldn't just be open to any person to take a dog into any premises. So could you take a dog into the City of Vincent Admin to go and pay your renewal licence fee? Do we allow dogs in our... Oh, I'm just asking, because I will do it if I'm allowed to. <laughs> Th 
through you, Mayor Cole, based on the, um, the current local law, uh, 5.A1A excludes dogs from a public building. So at the current point in time, strictly speaking, it would be no. We may need to have an outdoor doggy desk for dog registrations. <laughs> Are there any other questions on this item? Councillor Hallett. Thanks, Mayor. I've got a bit of a series. Um, through you, Mayor, to the um, Director of Community Engagement. Um, could you just clarify what the current staffing schedule is in the pound? Through you, Mayor Cole, we've actually amended the staffing schedule. Uh, previously, we did have a roster where uh, staff were based at the pound on an ongoing basis. Uh, but given the fact that we uh, have quite a low incidence of impounding dogs, it just wasn't efficient or practical to continue that. So generally speaking, uh, there is always a ranger available at the depot to assist, um, or it's uh, based uh, upon appointment. Further, just go for it, Councillor Hallett, ask your series of questions. Um, so does that ranger, the ranger is there all the time, still there? Through you, Mayor Cole, it's, it's not a single ranger necessarily, but there is always uh, either the coordinator of ranger services, the senior ranger, or one of the rangers throughout their shift. So generally speaking, there is always a ranger at the depot and therefore available to service the pound. Um, would you be able to clarify, I guess, the functions conferred and also what requirements are of um, someone who's appointed under the Dog Act, under the Section 29.1, to be an authorised person? What is the, I guess, skill set requirements from them? Through you, Mayor Cole, rather than guessing, I will just take that on notice and get an accurate response in the briefing, though. Um, and can I, I sent through a question earlier which you've responded to. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe that could be in the briefing notes as well. And that was just in relation to, um, in the last financial year, there were 26 dogs impounded, one of those being euthanised by the owner request. Um, and um, I guess the follow-up to that, of the remaining dogs, um, how many were rehomed versus claimed? Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll take that on notice and provide that extra information in the briefing notes. Any more dog questions? Okay, we'll move on to a big ticket item, 7.4, adoption of the 2017-18 annual budget. We have had six workshops on this item, so seven. Okay, seven. So I'm not expecting thousands of questions, but please go ahead and ask any questions. Councillor Lode and then Councillor Toppleberg. Uh, two questions. Um, just... Um, in terms of the number, we've had seven workshops since started, I think, uh, in February. Could you just confirm when we started considering this and, um, if possible, roughly how many hours has Council spent considering the budget? Um, when and then, was five hours alone? <laughs> not including this meeting. Um, and then the second one was uh, there was some discussion around credit card fees uh, for... Um, people when they pay their rates and I just wanted to get um, a response on how that currently works at the City of Vincent. Uh, through the Chair, obviously the first item we will take on notice and uh, compile that information. In respect to the second, um, I did belatedly uh, respond to your email but um, essentially we have looked into it. The information I have um, had provided for me doesn't adequately address all the information in respect to um, the different... Um, it, it certainly provides me some information about what are the fees we're currently paying for the different types of uh, revenue that we're receiving. What it doesn't tell me is um, what would it take for us to introduce a credit card fee in a machine like a ticket issue machine or in the booking system used at BD Park, or even our own system, if we were to um, endeavour to introduce a, a, a fee for those instances where a credit card is paid. So I need to um, get some information from the relevant providers as to how that might be facilitated. 
I can, however, provide a breakdown of what are the costs we are currently paying for the different payment methods that we incur. So I shall um, provide that through. I guess um, so th that sort of addresses the question around how we would introduce it citywide. Do we have the ability to just introduce it purely for um, rates, or does it have to be applied for all credit card transactions across the entire city? Uh, through the chair, um, very good question. I guess the city could introduce it. It is it's a city prerogative. Um, one could argue that the ticket issue machines you could build it into the cost. The problem there is that um, therefore that cost is going to be borne whether you paid cash or paid credit card, albeit that um, the credit card payments are increasing and, and in time you'd presume that there will be more credit card than cash payments. Um, it, so it is up to the city, but we will need to look at whether there is any um, uh, lawful requirements if you're going to introduce it, how you might segregate that, etc. So certainly need to understand more fully the um, system issues of how we would implement a fee specifically for credit cards. Is that information that you're able to provide by Friday? It sounds relatively technical. Um, through the chair, I can guarantee we wouldn't have the answer by Friday, knowing um, sometimes how difficult it is to get those sorts of answers from the suppliers of these systems, and, and in particular if you have um, multiple layers. So whilst we have a ticket issuing machine, we have a, um, a different merchant um, that that is involved in terms of the payment systems that are employed. So it might not simply be um, information from the ticket issue machine vendor, it might also be the ticket issue machine vendor and the merchant who provides us with, a, with the card. So uh, it, complicated. Just to clarify, I think this issue really came up around fees for receiving rates. Um, so I guess the first question is, can we look at fees for receiving rates in excluding other fees received as number one? And then if we can, what are the fees involved in receiving rates by uh, credit card versus debit versus our um, city's website, etc.? I think that was really what Council was interested in knowing rather than having to go out to each ticket vending um, operator. Any further questions? Councillor Tobelberg. Thank you. A um, couple of, just, I suppose, requests. One, can we get some data on the car parking uh, on Brewer Street? So that's adjacent to... Um, uh, actually, I think it was Brewer and Pier. By council decision, the car parking went from, I think, $1.60 per hour up to two seventy per hour. Uh, and I'd just be interested to know, in a similar vein, to the decision that we made around, or that was made around keeping Richmond Street at a lower level because it serviced uh, uh, local parking or otherwise. I'd be interested to know what the actual revenue is, has been from those machines uh, in, say, the 12 months prior and 12 months since that decision was made. Um, so I, I, I don't know if it includes Brewer and Pier, but it was certainly uh, that, that section of Brewer Street, which is adjacent to um, NRB Stadium. Um, I will also flag an amendment to, which I did bring up in the workshop, to delete the fee for access to, uh, to recorded information. So, um, proposed to be a twenty-two dollar fee, but I will um, seek to uh, remove that fee. Um, and in terms of the budget itself, um, I will. Uh, and there was an email sent minutes before we walked in here from uh, from the Acting Director of Technical Services that relates specifically to the proposal at Axford Park, but I'm uh, just flagging that I will be seeking to, uh, not to reallocate those funds, but to take um, a, a proportion of those funds. I will circulate it before the end of the week um, and to have a commensurate reduction in the proposed rate increase. There was also a question raised by Mr Meyer about the FOI fee. Um, my understanding of FOI fees is that it's a statutory fee rather than something that the city has an ability to, to um, change. 
through the chair, um, actually what he was identifying was an error on um, one of our uh, supporting schedules on page 2.17, where we're actually reflecting that our freedom of information revenue is $2.45 million. Um, it's clearly an error. Um, they're, they're, um, I can't account for why it's showing that figure there, but it's actually um, pulling in a figure from BD Park revenue rather than freedom of information, so we'll correct that. The total is correct. It's just the distribution of that revenue. There are two areas on that page that we'll need to correct. I did forget a question. Um, I think I know the answer, so I'll just in relation to Kids Galore North Perth uh, and the waiving of rates, is that because it isn't present in their lease? Or is, can I, is the lease silent um, upon that? Because they do, they certainly pay rates and, well, it's not exempt in their other property within the city. So this is city owned property. Just I know that that's the reason why Subiaco and East Perth differs because it's in one lease and not the other. Um, or am I, or is that also an omission from there? Through the chair, uh, Kids Galore is actually listed. On yeah, so, um, yeah, but are they exempt because their lease specifically exempts them or are they exempt because we've never charged them because the lease is silent on it? Through the chair, as highlighted in the report, what we're endeavouring here is to correct a process that um, in the past the city has not rated a, a number of properties that would actually be, that are not automatically exempt. And so each of the properties that are listed under recommendation six, and I would highlight, well, I'll have to look at that because I'm not sure why East Perth is not on there. So East Perth Football Club should also be on there. So these represent all of those um, city-owned land that would not be exempt under any of the other provisions under section 6.26 of the Act, and are therefore, because this is um, a new process, we're suggesting that we should waive the fee because that is a um, not an uncommon process to occur um, at local governments, but also to highlight that what we should be doing is developing a policy on that on this situation so that we can um, deal with this more strategically in the future. Further questions? Um, look, I will probably ask a few during the week. I returned from leave today, so I haven't gone through the final budget draft version. Um, so I will do so. Um, moving on now to item... Moving into Community Engagement Territory, item 8.1, Public Artwork Donation, Homeo Sapiens, Sapiens by Desmond Ma. Any questions on this item? Councillor Gondoszewski. I'll just through you to the Director of Community Engagement. Just a query in relation to whether the Arts Advisory Group will be asked to provide advice and recommendations on the donation or acquisition of this artwork, um, whilst it's not in the... I don't think it's in the proposed public art policy, it would appear to be within the city's scope to seek their advice and the draft policy for art in general is out for advertising. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that did occur. Uh, and indeed, uh, a number of the, the queries that administration since went through in terms of uh, the structural integrity of the artwork in particular um, was uh, or did come from queries raised by the advisory group. Councillor Hallett. Just in relation to the structural integrity and the... Um, how will we maintain the, the fencing or the support structures... Um, for the art. Through you, Mayor Cole, that the public art is fundamentally on a concrete plinth um, and uh, and held up with some some steel supports, for one of a one of a better word. So it is something that uh, we, administration has actually started to do more proactively in the last twelve months. Is uh, inspect our public art and our murals on a regular basis and actually uh, budget for a public artwork um, maintenance on an ongoing basis. So um, our current 
um, acting coordinator of arts and creativity is responsible for reviewing all of our artworks and proactively maintaining them um, as required. Are there any further questions on this item? Okay, we'll move on to Chief Executive Officer. First of all, item 9.1, a late report on the Corporate Business Plan 2017-18 to 2020-21. Are there any questions in relation to this? Councillor Gondoshevsky, Councillor Hallett and then Councillor Loden. Whilst I acknowledge we have also had a number of discussions on this, I just want one quick clarification in relation to Banks Reserve. I note that 1718, uh, the Banks Reserve Master Plan will be prepared and um, the playground upgrade um, is scheduled for 1920. Um, I'm presuming that in the intervening year there will be, uh, there is likely to be some, um, I guess, operational activities that may not incur additional costs. Um, but that would support the um, implementation of the playground upgrade in the following year. I guess I'm just wanting confirmation that, you know, things aren't grinding to a halt for 12 months in the intervening um, time. Am I able to get that from the Director of Community Engagement? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it will be business as usual, uh, technical services do undertake uh, the playground audits. Um, so it will certainly be maintained in a safe manner um, as it would be whether the master plan was being prepared or not. Councillor Hallett. Thanks, uh, through you Mayor, to the probably Director of Technical Services. Um, just relating to the question from the, or the comment from the public gallery around a perceived delay in um, parking technology um, in the budget and whether you can comment uh, for the viewers at home around the reasons for that. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yes, uh, so the, the parking technology uh, CBP item is actually a, a rolling item in terms of as we start to better investigate and better understand what technologies are out there, we'll start to investigate, investigate those and implement those. So um, I guess the comment in the public gallery that we're doing nothing until 1920, for example, is, is incorrect. Uh, this year, um, actually it's last financial year now, we did introduce or finalise the introduction of QR technology for our um, parking permits. So you will uh, see the rollout of those permits over the coming weeks and months um, that now have a QR code and our rangers have smartphones and enables them to simply scan the QR code to see whether that permit is valid or not. That's something we haven't had the capabilities of doing previously. Um, what we've flagged uh, in two years' time is then moving to e-permits, uh, which will require no permits at all. Um, but there's a bit of work we need to do to work out how that will be managed. Uh, for example, e-permits have to run with a vehicle. They run with licence plates, uh, whereas uh, the most recent changes to Council's parking permit policy has our parking permits running with the property. Um, so we've got some things that we need to work out. E-permits is definitely the way to go, but from a logistic and an operational perspective, how do we do that? Uh, there are some other things we've been doing in the parking technology space as well. Um, on the draft budget, we've got uh, the, the pilot program for the parking sensors. Um, we've just introduced the pay-by-plate machines in North Perth um, and the avenue is about to happen as well and the frame court pay-by-plate machines will occur. So we are certainly rolling out the new technologies but um, it's done on an incremental basis as we start to understand what we need and, and where we need it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Loden, I think you are next. Oh, Councillor Hallett, have you finished with your questions? Yes. My only question was just, is, uh, is there possible to f show a track changes of the um, CBP? Or is the modifications too significant? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, 
it would be quite difficult to, in this document, show track changes simply because we've introduced additional columns and a little bit more detail than was shown in last year's version of the corporate business plan. We've also taken some of the comments. Uh, one of the previous columns that was included in last year's adopted version was a reference to the relevant advisory or working groups. We've taken that out for the simple reason that because Council now has clearly adopted terms of references for each of those advisory and working groups, um, each time one of these particular projects requires referral to a working group, it will happen as a matter of course. It doesn't need to be documented um, in the corporate business plan. Having said that, um, in every instance, other than what has previously been discussed through workshops um, or separately in written notifications uh, with council members, administration through relevant directorates has, um, wherever possible, maintained the previous timing from the previously adopted corporate business plan. Um, there are probably from memory about three or four items that have been carried forward and in carrying them forward from the corporate business plan. The time frame has been pushed out a year because other priorities have come in earlier than those. So I could certainly identify those by exception and include them in the briefing notes uh, in time for next week's meeting. Any further questions on the corporate business plan? Okay, I'll move on. Um, item 9.2 we have dealt with as the first item given the number of questions raised tonight from the public gallery. So that just leaves item 9.3, the information bulletin. Are there any questions in relation to that? Councillor Loden. Uh, just on the MRC meeting minutes, I uh, noted that um, there was a proposal to move, uh, to identify if the MRC can move from a band three to a band two council. And I was just wondering if that took place, what would be the cost implications for the city in terms of their financial support of the MRC? And um, I guess probably not related to the minutes, but uh, is there any update on the waste t to energy tender process as well? Because I thought that was supposed to come back to this meeting. Would you like me to answer the first question, given that I was at the meeting? That was just to investigate, so I didn't vote against it. But yes, the um, question of budget implications was forefront of my mind, um, and it was um, moved by the. Oh, it was a notice of motion from the chair, um, using other um, similar. Um, I think using Tamala Park as a as an example, which it's questionable. <laughs> um, the other question in relation to, there's certainly no discussion on the waste to energy um, tender at the most recent Mindari Regional Council meeting. There was no discussion on or offline of that matter. So I'll refer now to the CEO to see if there's been any further update. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, council members might recall, I think it was last uh, last week or perhaps a week and a half ago, I did circulate a confidential email to all council members just providing a copy of um, some recent feedback that I've provided to the Minara Regional Council on a couple of agreements that uh, were referenced in council's most recent decision regarding that matter. And um, the status of it so far is that I'm reviewing a draft report that the MRC has prepared specifically in response to Council's resolution. Um, I will be reviewing that um, not for modification of the response that's provided by the MRC, but just to ensure completeness that their report um, sufficiently addresses and responds to all of the various questions and concerns that had previously raised, been raised by council members or administration in relation to that project. Uh, once I'm satisfied that, that for completeness addresses all of uh, the city's previous questions and concerns regarding that matter, then the only uh, piece of the puzzle that will remain is to get clarification, confirmation from either the MRC or all member councils of the MRC as to what its respective council decisions were in relation to that proposal. And then I will liaise with the Mayor to see if council is willing or able to convene a special council meeting just to consider that particular item or whether council instead wishes to await the <coughs> August ordinary council meeting to have that conversation. But um, as I said, I expect to, uh, I think the last council in the MRC 
to make a decision on it is the Town of Cambridge, which is scheduled to consider the matter at its ordinary meeting next week. Councillor Loden. Um, just to follow up on the, the band three versus band two, obviously that changes allowances and so forth. Um, assuming that that took place, um, do we, is it possible to get an idea of what that might cost? And do, I, and the other, I guess, do we have any authority over that decision as well? Or is that just something they can decide to do? Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll deal with the last part of that question. It's probably the easiest because the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal will make the decision as to the banding of the Regional Council. It's not a decision that either the Regional Council or any of its members can make, um, in the same way as the Tribunal has determined that Vincent is a band two council. Um, as for the costs, it's a relatively simple exercise using the bandings that are already available in the most recent SAT determination to identify the difference in total um, fees payable to members and the presiding member of a regional council that is of a band two compared to a band three equivalent and also for uh, the TRP or the total remuneration um, or total reward package for the CEO of a band two versus band three. So um, we can easily provide that information and then I suppose it would uh, be proportionately distributed between all of the members. So. That'll be a relatively straightforward exercise. Yes, yeah, so that is it in the nutshell. The, mo the notice of motion was to request consideration of whether it would be worthwhile putting it up to the Salaries and Administrative Tribunal, but ultimately the SAT, the independent um, statutory authority, makes a decision, um, statutory body rather, not the Mindari Regional Council, absolutely not. How However, it will only SAT will only consider it if the Mindari Council asks them to. They're not going to consider well, it. Well, SAT should conduct their own reviews and should form a view on whether there is grounds to reclass reclassify the band or move the band up and down. I guess then they will trigger a review through request. But it doesn't always just come through request. The SAT will actually make that assessment regardless. Um, this was just going to them to appeal to them to make that assessment. So I believe that in asking them to make that assessment, there has to be merit and there has to be grounds for that, um, that um, additional classification. But it will have to come back to MRC to actually send an official request to the SAT. This is just stage one. So there is an opportunity. This is simply an internal assessment, um, hence I didn't see any major issue in being the lone um, dissenting voice in the room on this particular issue. Um, through you, Mayor, so when, it, when and if a submission is lodged, the City of Vincent would be able to make a submission as to our view? Well, I'll be able to ha make, um, I'll be able to read the report that comes back to Mindari Regional Council and as a representative I'll be able to put a view on whether I believe it should be submitted to the SAT and I believe that SAT does take public um, submissions but I'm not in terms of a reclassification of a band CEO do they take public submissions on those sorts of issues? Um, through you Mayor Cole um I wouldn't have thought that it's customary for the SAT in considering a um, change of banding for a council or a regional council to um, put out a call for public submissions. I know that in each year that the SAT um, reconsiders its past year's determination and establishes a fresh determination for the year ahead, um, it is then at that stage, usually around February or March, um, they make available uh, for public comment and um, it's at that stage that a lot of council members or councils or chief executive officers will submit proposals to the tribunal for their consideration. Um, but I'm not entirely sure as to, in considering an extraordinary or out of cycle request of that nature, whether they would 
um, invite public submissions on the same because there may not be a, um, a large public interest in that type of issue. If it's a public report that is provided to me and they don't put this up as a confidential item, I'm happy to inform council members once I receive the report and if you're interested, more than happy for you to, to read the report prior to me going to the MRC meeting. Any further questions on the information bulletin? Okay, so I will declare the meeting closed at 8.59.